Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to What's Up With That, the show that brings you interesting people, places, cultures, and subcultures here in the South Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area, the state of California, and beyond. And tonight, what's up with autism in the classroom? What's up with autistic behaviors? And how do we teach our autistic children? Well, recently I was reading an article that said that one out of every 100 children born today in America are born autistic. That's a lot. Years ago, I can only assume that people didn't know what to do with autistic children. I mean, they have behaviors that are not typical in a typical classroom, if a typical classroom exists anymore. Um, and I'm sure for many teachers, it was like, oh no, look what I got stuck with. Well, education has changed. We're inclusive. We want every child to succeed. The autistic children are just like every other child. They just have a, to be taught in a little different way. And tonight we have a special ed specialist who specializes in teaching autism. And we're great to have her. She's a real good friend of mine. And you're going to love her, Jen Jennifer Mummy. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. Welcome nice to, to see. the show. So what are like the symptoms of autism? Um, well, there's no real direct symptoms. They have diagnoses that they do and conduct um, anywhere from zero to three months and on. Mm -hmm. um, every school district is legally liable at three years old to, t um, to diagnose and treat or place children in special classes, specialized design classes mm -hmm. to um, help with right. their autism and progress their education. Yeah, and that's what makes it so weird with autism is that they don't really have a diagnosis sort of thing they don't have a they don't know what causes it I mean that's a big that's a big issue you know I mean I was reading something they said there could be pesticides it could be but nobody knows so it makes it really hard so how do you diagnose your autistic child or what's the process of so um, a lot of children that um, have delays go to um, like early start programs uh -huh. and from early start they go to um, an FSP um, which is what? Mm, that's a good question. It's like an IEP, yeah. <laughs> it's like an IEP, but it's their transition from early start, which is before three, mm -hmm. to their three-year-old preschool classroom at their district. Okay. At whatever school district they reside in. Okay, so then at three years old, they're put into a special program? Is it a special preschool? Um, each district has their own programs that they create, or if they don't have programs that they create, they outsource to other districts or counties. Mm -hmm. um, so once they get assessed, they use um, various milestones. Um, so it could be like if they're an infant and your child's not responding to your touch and you know very upset and crying and lethargic mm -hmm. when you're touching them, that's a sign. Or they're not making direct eye contact, or right. your child's been speaking since... Um, you know, they were a couple, a year old or something, and then all of a sudden they're not speaking at all. Right. Uh, those are all milestones that would trigger your pediatrician to have them checked or sent to an early start program. Okay, and so when they check for autism, what are they looking for? They're just checking off the milestones that the pediatrician goes through okay. and checks in with uh, the parents. It's based on parent... Um, you know their perception of what's going on at home mm -hmm. and then what the pediatrician sees and when it's very when they're very young it's very clinical mm -hmm. so it's not um, you know in-home assessment necessarily right and then I know more about when they're three and on right so um, what I know because I'm and one of the reasons that's important that you're here tonight is that I have an autistic child that I just started this week and we'll get into that you know later but one of the things that I noticed, and I don't know if this is something that's an autistic behavior in general, but this child doesn't socialize with anybody. Right. Absolutely no one. Right. So that goes with the not wanting to be touched, not wanting to be near other people. They could be overstimulated by light, sound, um, people in the room, noise, uh, smell. smell, anything. Any of the senses can mm -hmm. overstimulate the child and want them to regress into their own space. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you have this type of environment let's start with the environment then you know you're, you're setting up your classroom how do you set up your classroom knowing these things that you know so my classroom set up very similar to any typical preschool setting the only difference is that like all of the toys and items that we use like the play-doh um, if we're doing shaving cream sensory tables um, 
cars, blocks. In a regular school, you're going to see those out, and they're going to uh -huh. be available. The arts and crafts stuff, scissors, painting utensils, you know, those things, glue, paint, uh, sorry, tape, right. all things like that are going to be out and accessible for the children. Mm -hmm. um, in my room, they're up and put away, and we right. have pictures that um, the children use to request. And so we set up the communication so that they can learn how to speak and socialize mm -hmm. with their peers. So we have smaller class sizes. Um, we do more one-to-one -one work. So you can have anywhere from three adults to six kids, so a two-to-one ratio. Uh -huh. You know, it just depends on each program. Right. So in your particular program, you're in the room with how many children? Um, currently, I have six children mm -hmm. in a room, and I have three adults. And okay. last wow, year, towards nice. the end of the year, we had, uh, let's see, we had ten children and three adults. Okay. So, and then we have you know, peers that come in and join us that are so-called typical developing. So they're mm -hmm. at uh, what you would consider a typical development. So mm -hmm. the children are learning from their peers and we're just helping mm -hmm. helping the children connect with them right. by setting up situations that they can interact. So if we're doing an activity that, um, like we're doing an art activity where they're gluing hearts on a piece of paper, we're going to only put one glue stick and have four kids working. So they have to ask for it and share and okay. man and request. All right. Yeah, so it, it's a, that social skills kind right. of thing. Right, so we're teaching that through mm -hmm. daily interaction. Right, and that's what I, 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 in the past, had, you know, other autistic children. That's always been the biggest thing. And for me, it's been the, the social interaction. And I have parents that want to put their kids in a program where they're going to be around other kids. Right. But it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't. <laughs> so how do you deal with... Um, the nonverbal child. So um, it depends. Each child's either verbal or nonverbal, and there's various stages. Um, a child that's completely nonverbal, we can use some different things. We have like this is a go talk, mm -hmm. and so when you press it, yeah, um, when you turn it on and press it, it would say either all done, or more, or mm -hmm. like this is an icon, what we would call an icon, and that's for books, or this is. Um, a container and you can use real objects. So mm -hmm. if you're talking about a book, you can get a mini book and stick it here. Okay. And so you, the teacher sets it up and these come out. And so you can set it up however you want okay. to whatever icons or things you're trying to teach that child. Uh -huh. So for this particular child that it's set up for, it's set up for snack to be finished with an activity and the child's favorite activity, which is books. Okay. So I think that brings up another point though about autism that I was also reading in, in that there's no two autistic kids identical. I mean, right. So another child might be using um, a picture uh, communication book where all their icons would be okay. in here in this book, and um, they would pick the they would pick what they want. So if they want bathroom, they would open the book, pick bathroom, close the book, and um, if we were doing an I want, if they were on a sentence strip, it would say I want, and then they would say bathroom, and you'd prompt them to say it. Or another child could be at a different stage where they're just getting it from the book and handing it to you. Okay, all like right. Like this well, to request it. We're going to take a short a station break. This is very interesting stuff, and I'm sure those of you that have autistic children will be very interested to know that there's a lot of things happening in autism. We'll be right back with um, to discuss more about autism in the classroom. So stay tuned. There's this guy, always in my face, shouting at me, just pushes me, but I love him. He's my coach, my coach. Be a coach, be a fan, Special Olympics. My name is Aaron. I have a wish. I want to be a cowboy. And I rope cows. And I'm going to drink milk in the saloon and yodel songs at the moon. A cowboy's life is a royal life. His saddle, his kingly throne. I want to be a cowboy. Hi, welcome back to What's Up With That. I'm here with Jennifer Mummy. She is a special ed specialist. And we were talking about the communication book. 
And this is really important because this is, like I said before, there's no one, two children that are the same. So talk a little bit more, more about this because I think this is kind of central to how you teach them communication. So we were talking about how you can hand it over um, if you're at that level versus um, pulling it out and having a full sentence strip. So um, there's also icons that like these ones that have words written on them. That's uh -huh. probably hard to see. But you have, it's called an embedded schedule or an embedded book where the words are on it. So if they're learning how to read, uh -huh. they can attempt to read the word and see the icon and then you okay. would slowly phase out the word. Okay, so it's sort of like labeling for like right. the preschool. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. It's very similar to labeling. So right. and you would put things in their book that they enjoy or do consistently. So like this in child in particular did, you know, the pop beads, this toy, lacing, things like that, that they like, you know, work, I need a break. Uh -huh. And they would hand it to you as needed. That's cool. I need a break. <laughs> and so you can see here some icons are pictures. Some are from like the internet or clip art. Uh -huh. Some can be if you have the tub that we had earlier mm -hmm. or even a Ziploc bag we use um, to hold an icon or it would be an actual item. Mm -hmm. It can be anything like that. So this is particularly for the non-verbal ones? Um, even the verbal ones sometimes like especially when you're doing meals or if you're going to somewhere new you can um, introduce icons as you see fit. So like mm -hmm. your store icon might be a you know an S sign for Safeway, okay, and you might use that for every store you go to, and your child would learn that that means store, store. okay, and you can generalize it. Once your child is generalizing, uh -huh. then they will understand that. Um, like in my particular classroom, this means choice, okay, so that means that they get to choose an activity, okay, and so when we're setting up communication, I'm putting out the choices that are available. So mm -hmm. my classroom versus a typical school, right. wouldn't have everything available at mm -hmm. once. There's only going to be three choices, let's say. See, so I can only imagine how difficult it must be for a mildly autistic child to be uh, in a regular classroom sometimes because they're not, it's not clicking with them. And the teachers, you know, we know those teachers. <laughs> we all have those grumpy teachers who don't want to do, the, you know, they don't want to do the extra effort. Right. It's well, thank a God there's people <laughs> like you who are who are there to, to to guide them through this process, and hopefully, you know that. Of course, the ultimate goal is what um, to fully include any child. So there's, um, you know, a continuum of services where a child's um, pulled independently by themselves, basically, all the way to fully inc included. Mm -hmm. And in any uh, program that helps special needs children or gifted and talented children, they go from the least restrictive environment to the um, the one that where they can, or from the most sorry, from the most restrictive mm -hmm. environment to the least restrictive. Yeah. So in our case would be the SDC class to the classroom setting. Right. And so every child at a different level, so they either push into some. May, some kids go to regular mm -hmm. preschool either before or after my class, or they get pushed into mm -hmm. regular preschool during my class time. Mm -hmm. And there's different um, people that come in and work with them in, in the classroom, like right. we have OT, speech, yeah. um, a big ABA. support network for them. There is. Uh -huh. Well, that's good. I mean, and I can only imagine, you know, being a parent, it would just be so probably nerve-wracking, especially if a kid's moving from one stage to another. And, you know, so, you know, I think my hat's off to the parents, too, because they're, I know they've Got a lot of stress going on in there. Um, but I do know also that autistic kids do have like outbursts. Um, sometimes they scream, mm -hmm. uh, have fits, whatever. Now, how do you deal with that? It depends on why the tantrum or fit or outburst is coming on. Um, if it's something that's not known, like I've had a child who throws themselves on the floor mm -hmm. and it, we would know when it was coming. It's either they didn't want to do the activity that was that they wanted or the routine was changed mm -hmm. or they didn't understand what I'm asking them to do. Okay. So, and then you can attempt to change the behavior by giving, replacing it with another behavior. So if they're doing this, 
uh-huh. and you want them to stop, then you would give them a different activity like a puzzle or something else or um, holding that hand down so you're like this on uh-huh. the child so he can't or she can't do that anymore. Uh-huh. And then they're using the other hand to do either do what you're asking them to or to do something else. Okay. Um, sometimes when you do that, another behavior can arise that could be uh-huh. worse yeah. or better. Well, but that's you know? any child. Right, that's true, you know? any child. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I can't think of any child that doesn't like not being able to do what they want to do. Right. So in the extreme cases, you know, let's say you have a child that's, which I don't know if you've ever had like an extreme case or whatever. Um, what's the next step? Do they, do they get removed from your classroom? Do they, is there? Um, you know, in every classroom is different based on the teacher, even in special education. Uh-huh. Um, but they have behavior support plans. They have ex- actual behaviorists that can come in and work with the mm-hmm. child. Um, you can take antecedent data where you mm-hmm. do, you know, the um, antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. So mm-hmm. what what happened prior to, what's happening during, like what they're actually doing, the behavior, mm-hmm. and then what happened right after. Yeah. And um, based on all of that, you can work with that child on changing the behavior. Okay. If the child's doing something where they're hurting themselves or another child, then we either remove, we would generally remove everyone else from the area. So like okay. if they're in my classroom and they're throwing things or chairs or something, uh-huh. I'm gonna take the other kids to the playground and we're gonna change up our activity. Okay. So we're not gonna let other people be hurt. If their child's pulling their hair out, we're going to uh-huh. hold that child's hair. They're, we're gonna let them tantrum and we're yeah. gonna basically ignore the behavior uh-huh. because it's attention seeking okay. generally. Well. The child that I had the first day, uh, Monday, um, was had gone in to the an art area and he was putting feathers in his mouth, and so I was like, <laughs> "No, we don't want to put, you know, feathers in our mouth." And so when I went to try to remove it, he bit me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Did you just bite me?" <laughs> Is he verbal? A little bit. Okay. Okay, I mean, he can say, he understands, like, yes and no, but he doesn't listen. I mean, you'll say no, and he just takes off. Okay. He, you know, it could be self-stimulatory for the feathers to be in his mouth. It could be soothing. Mm-hmm. It could be, I mean, sensory issues are very common in children with autism, so, right. or anyone on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was just, <laughs> I was just a little shocked, actually, at first, cause <laughs> I generally don't get bit, but <laughs> but I understand, you know. Yeah, and if he didn't have the words or skills to be able to sell you, no, I want my feather, mm-hmm. then, mm-hmm. you know, it would be like you not being able to tell me not to hit you, and I'm hitting you. Mm-hmm. You're going to react. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't take my feather, <laughs> all right? I want it. All right, we're going to take a, smor- a short commercial break, and we'll be back to talk more about p- children and autism in the classroom. So, see you in a second. Hi, my name's Celine, and I love being an Aquamaid because you make a lot of new friends during practice, and you can challenge yourself and have fun during practice all at the same time. Hi, my name's Madison Gress, and I love being an Aquamaid because it inspires me to work hard and achieve my dreams. Hi, my name's Elle Bilma, and I love being an Aquamaid because if you work hard and achieve your goals, you can go places. My team has been to Peru, Florida, and New York. Hi, I'm Emily Dillon, and I love being an Aquamaid because it not only opens doors to the Olympic pathway, but it also opens opportunities to collegiate programs and collegiate scholarships. Hi, my name is Bianca Johnson, and I am the coach for the Fence Fitness and Fun program. It is for beginner synchronized swimmers, and for more information, you can go to aquamaids.org, and it's under beginner programs. Go Big Red! Hi, I'm Ted Lempert, president of Children Now. We're a children's advocacy organization that seeks on behalf of kids for sound education and, and good health care and help us make a difference uh, and ensure that every child has the opportunity to reach their full potential. Hi, welcome back to What's Up About That. We're here with Jennifer Mummy. She is a special ed specialist. She teaches autistic children in the classroom and um, from what you've probably gathered from the show so far, it's not an easy task and so uh, one question I really haven't asked you is why did you choose to be a teacher of autistic children? Um, I really, the milestones that they make are so dramatic for them and it's so self-rewarding like I, 
It's so, mm -hmm. to know that I taught that. Right. Whereas in, you know, typical children, you teach them things every day. Right. It's not that you don't. You just uh -huh. don't see the progress. And the real active learners, you know, were... Right. And they, once you unlock them, like there's a key to uh -huh. figure out what, what they're into. Is it trains? Is it dolls? Is it Barbie? It, whatever it is, you can incorporate that into your teaching and uh -huh. then all kinds of things will happen right, Cause right it's in front of you. Right, and I, I think that has to do with the, the familiarness about that, mm -hmm. which brings me to my next thing. I know that most autistic children have a problem when their routine is changed, when something's not right. Mm -hmm. So how important is a daily routine to an autistic child? Um, we have the same daily routine every day, like in the classroom, and generally at home, um, we advise the parents to do the same thing mm -hmm. um, because it provides them with the schedule that they know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And like in my classroom, and I actually didn't bring one, but we have a visual schedule mm -hmm. where the icons like snack, bathroom, something like this would be set up on their schedule or it could be written if they're reading. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a day planner for children who are older. It can be all various types of ways. So if they're communicating, it would be are not communicating it would be pictures if they're communicating it could be words mm -hmm. or even uh, verbal uh, some kids listen to their schedule some okay. kids read it some kids write depending it depending on the situation yeah. you just have so they're to all accommodate. different but the schedule they can check it off and move on so even doing work in the classroom um, like we start in the preschool setting teaching them left to right by using teach stations and we use ta tasks that they can do independently um, and then as they get progressed, they do them at the table, but they're still the same type of task, like folder tasks where they open them up, self-explanatory, here's the beginning, here's the end. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there, they would move to the actual classroom setting to be able to do that task. So you're okay. adding more and more people. So when you say their workstation, what, is, what, are, you, what are you talking so about? So workstation is like a space where um, it's blocked on either side, okay. uh, usually like with a picture, two bookshelves on either side, a desk okay. in the middle facing like a wall. So they can't be... So there's distracted. no distraction. Okay. Right. And then they work independently in there um, mm -hmm. with no distraction unless they either need to be redirected because they're not doing their activity or right. if it's too hard, then, you know, we mess up and have to uh -huh. change it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it sounds like you must do an incredible amount of planning. I right. mean, you must spend enormous <laughs> hours of unpaid work <laughs> at home, as all educators do, <laughs> planning. It's a lot of planning because each child has an IEP, an individualized education plan, and all the goals that we work on in classroom, the social socialization goals, the language goals, uh -huh. the sensory goals, the potty training, independent life skill goals, mm -hmm. they're all based on their IEP. Right. And so the goals that we, the things we try to do in, in the teach station, something like this where it's matching, um, you know, we're, we're, they have to take the fish off and match it to the correct color. So they're not only, you know, removing a fine motor and putting a mm -hmm. gross motor, um, they're matching the color so they have to know the color, they're matching the shape because mm -hmm. you wouldn't put it this way on here, right? That's not correct. Okay. And that would bother an autistic child, probably. Would it? <laughs> Most likely, yes. <laughs> okay, because they want sameness. Right. Mm -hmm. Very linear. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you talked about potty training. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have children, and I assume, that don't know how to use the bathroom. Correct. Okay. So, part of your responsibility, then, is also to change diapers and this kind of thing? Right, and work on potty training. Okay, and how do you work on potty training with an autistic child? Um, all, like always, every child's different, uh, so you have to find out what is really going to be rewarding for that child, or what bothers them, what bothers them about the bathroom, mm -hmm. if they're ready but they're not using it. So it either could be that you're not giving them the choice, like you're saying, "Oh, it's bathroom time, let's go," and they're like, "No, no, 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 no." Mm -hmm. um, whereas you could say, you know we're going to go to the bathroom in five minutes, like just giving them the warning might help. It could be, you know, that they like the sensory feeling of having um, a wet diaper. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be all a range of things why they wouldn't want to be potty trained. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just find out what they're into and try to use that. And we only use it for that. So like if the child was into a ball, mm -hmm. we're going to right. use just this. An autistic child would love this. Right. Right. I mean, because the, yeah, the whole yeah. thing going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Um, so if they're into that, then that's what they're going to get every time they sit on the potty, whether they go potty okay. or not. And then you progress from there. And the yeah. parents have to do the same thing at home. So it's uh, a lot of communication right. and speaking with the parents because they know the most about their children. Yeah. So you probably really have to coordinate with the parents, like we do daily. We do and make sure. So what what um what kind of clinical um, help is there for autistic children? I mean, is there medications that they take? Is there, I don't know, you, you know what I'm talking about? Um, every, every program's different and every child's IEP is different. So some parents might put them on a, you know, a diet, a special diet. They might have them on a special sensory, like they do different things like brushing or gluten-free diets or, um, you know, more time on like a trampoline, the jumping sensation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it all depends. Each child's different. Or rolling a ball on their arm, things mm -hmm. like that um, are all things that they can do. Um, actual clinical things, I mean, like coming from a doctor's perspective would be diagnosed and done through their pediatrician and right. such. Um, in school, we only work on their child education. Okay. So we're only, in their IUP, we're only putting things that are going to progress their child's education mm -hmm. in the classroom setting. Right. And I've been to your classroom, so I know what it looks like. And one thing that I noticed, and we'll, we have to wrap the show in a second, but I noticed that, you know, the windows were, were covered. Um, that, but one concern, and my last concern, you have to give me a real quick answer here, is what do you do for the runner? Because all the autistic children I've had have, uh, were bolters. Um, they so run out the door. So um, in my classroom, it's not quite such an issue because we're, they're in preschool. They don't all know how to open the door. <laughs> okay. um, but the ones that do, we generally put up gates that mm -hmm. have the child protective latches mm -hmm. um, because lots of times they won't figure out how to open them unless they stand directly right there and watch you doing it. Okay. But I found out that from this child, he watches me do something. I hit a, a deck of cards and he and went knows. right after it. Because he wanted it. Yep. And if they want something, they know how to get it, and, and they work towards that. And I tried to put the games up, and he got a chair. Mm -hmm. I was saying, you know, he's, he's pretty good. All right, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for informing us on autism. I mean, I think it's a, there's so many parents that, you know, in the future, if it's one out of every hundred, that will be dealing with this issue. And so hopefully they will, um, or the ones that have just had a child that's been recently diagnosed with autism, will come to this tape as a resource. So thank you so much. And no keep problem. up the good work. Thank it's you. such a hard job. Thank you. Um, to our viewing audience, as always, if you're walking down the street and you see something interesting and you wonder to yourself, hey, what's up with that? Well, tune into our show, What's Up With That? Maybe you'll find exactly what you're looking for. We'll see you next week on What's Up With That. Good night, everybody.